Hi everyone and welcome back to Learn Neuroradiology. I'm Brent Weinberg. Today we're going to welcome Katie Bailey to tell us a little bit about the imaging findings of pulsatile tinnitus. So how to approach pulsatile tinnitus? Some findings are best seen on temporal bone CT and some are best seen on MRI of the brain and IACs with and without contrast. So we leave it up to the clinician to decide kind of which way they want to go first based on how the patient is presenting. In this presentation, I will review the main pathologies on both modalities. These are the causes by category. So you have neoplastic causes, arterial causes, venous causes, and two other disease processes that fall into that other category. I will be reviewing each of them. The glomus tympanicum is the most common middle ear tumor. There is a female predominance. The tumor arises from the Jacobson nerve at the cochlear promontory, which is this jutting of cortical bone at the level of the cochlea. It can cause permeative to destruction of the floor of the middle ear, but it's usually just a lobulated soft tissue density mass sitting here in the middle ear cavity at the level of the cochlear promontory. So this is a lo location that is classic and an appearance that is classic for a glomus tympanicum. You can have a glomus tympanico jugular, which means it connects from the middle ear cavity down to the jugular bulb. So you'll see what looks like a glomus tympanicum with that soft tissue mass along the cochlear promontory, but then you see that permeative bone destruction extending inferiorly to the level of the jugular bulb. And right here you can see you're losing that nice cortex around the jugular bulb. It has that moth-eaten appearance. Up here you can see that soft tissue mass extending down from the middle ear cavity, as well as some opacification of the bone, those air cells between the middle ear and the jugular bulb. Confirm this one on MRI, you see abnormal hyperintense flare signal in the area of the middle ear and the mastoid at the level of the jugular bulb on that left side. You can see the same thing on the T2 weighted image. It, feel, it looks like a permutative process of bright signal. And then when you give contrast, the mass enhances. So here's the middle ear component extending down to the jugular bulb. And here it is on the coronal compared to the normal side where you see no enhancement. Vestibular schwannoma is the most common tumor affecting the IAC. It usually arises from the inferior vestibular nerve. When they get big, they can show cystic change or hemorrhage. So this is the classic appearance on IAC imaging. You see a ice cream cone shaped mass widening the porous acousticus with enhancement extending into the internal auditory canal and in this case extending into the cerebellar pontine angle. Here it is on the coronal view, homogeneously enhancing, although it can be heterogeneous. And here is a smaller version of the same thing. Here is a nodular focus of enhancement within that distal IAC. So this would be a purely intracanalicular vestibular schwannoma, which because the tumor has vascularity going to it can result in pulsatile tinnitus. Other skull-based tumors, this is a homogeneously enhancing dural-based mass with a dural tail at the cerebellopontine angle, classic location and appearance for a CP angle meningioma. This one is less common. This tumor is hyper intense and bubbly on T2 weighted imaging in, at that petrous apex in the mastoid bone. It is hypo intense on T1 and it shows heterogeneous enhancement on T2. This is a location and appearance for a chondrosarcoma, that bubbly T2 expansile mass at the level of the petroclival ligament where there is cartilage lining is a location where you can see these chondrosarcomas. In terms of arterial anatomy, one you always have to look out for is that aberrant ICA. So here is foramen lacerum. You should have a bony covering of foramen lacerum throughout its course. You should not have the ICA pooching into that middle ear cavity. Nobody wants any pooching. Here it is on another view showing that there is no lateral bony wall of foramen lacerum and the ICA is extending into that middle ear cavity. And here it is on the coronal view. So here's a normal side and then the left side shows that aberrant ICA, which we don't want anybody to biopsy thinking it is a middle ear mass. A persistent stapedial artery is a harder thing to diagnose because it's 
difficult to see this tapedial artery. So when you have somebody with pulsatile tinnitus and you're looking at their temporal bone CT, always look for the presence of foramen lacerum. So here's foramen oval, which is anteromedial, and then here is foramen spinosum, which is posterior lateral at the skull base, and this is the opening for the middle meningeal artery. Absence of the middle meningeal artery is what leads to a persistent stapedial artery to supply the intracranial dura. So every temporal bone CT looking for pulsatile tinnitus, always look for the presence of foramen spinosum. If it's absent, that can be an indication that there is a persistent stapedial artery, whether you can see it or not. Vascular loop syndromes, you can have microvascular compression of the nerves in the IAC that can cause tinnitus, vertigo, and in some cases, hemifacial spasm like this patient. So you can have compression of the seventh and eighth nerve complex at their origin at the level of the brainstem, or you can have a vessel extending into the IAC, usually the labyrinthine artery, which is a branch of the AICA, that can cause nerve compression or pulsation in that vessel can cause the sensation of the pulsatile tinnitus. Carotid abnormalities have been associated with pulsatile tinnitus, extending from carotid stenosis, which this side you can see there's significant carotid stenosis caused by that complex placking, as opposed to the left where they've had a carotid endarterectomy. You can also see it from a dissection. Here's the intimal flap with dilation of the vessel due to the dissection or you can see it in fibromuscular dysplasia. So here's the beaded appearance of that mid to distal cervical ICA, the classic appearance of fibromuscular dysplasia, FMD. Next, you can have a lesion referred to as a facial or cavernous hemangioma. This is found at the superior aspect of the temporal bone at the mastoid portion. This is a honeycomb appearance of an expansile lesion above the level of the cochlea and IAC. You can see it has that honeycomb appearance expansion. You can see here's the lesion on the T1 pre-contrast. The lesion enhances post-contrast because it is a vascularized lesion. And sometimes you get lucky and you can see it on the axial T2. It has a bubbly appearance. It's round. This is a facial hemangioma or cavernous hemangioma. On the venous side, you can have a dehiscent jugular bulb, which is absence of the bony lateral wall of the jugular bulb. So there is no separation between the jugular bulb and that middle ear cavity. So here's absence of the bone on the coronal. And here it is on a CTA slash CTV. You can see the jug filling and there's no bone separating it from the middle ear cavity. You can get a venous diverticulum. In this case, this was a sigmoid sinus diverticulum. So where the sigmoid plate is, you can see there's a bulbous outpouching into the bone. Here it is on the coronal view. And to confirm that this is from the sigmoid sinus, you can do a CTA slash CTV, which shows that sigmoid sinus diverticulum extending into the mastoid bone with some thinning or absence of the wall of the mastoid air cell. So that pulsation can get transmitted into the mastoid air cells and potentially result in pulsatile tinnitus. You can also get a diverticulum of the jugular bulb itself as well as the transverse sinus, but this is the case I had of a sigmoid sinus diverticulum. You can get a vascular malformation. This one is a dural AV fistula at the brainstem level. You can see all these abnormal flow voids in the prepontine cistern with flow voids at the level of the seventh and eighth nerve complex. You can confirm that with post contrast imaging where you can see some of these vessels enhance. Another venous problem is idiopathic intracranial hypertension or IIH. One of the hallmarks, the most specific sign, is bilateral venous stenosis involving the lateral segments of the transverse sinuses. This is basically at the sigmoid transverse sinus junction. So what you would see is normal contrast opacification of the transverse sinus. Then you see this area where you don't see much flow. And then when you get to the sigmoid, it looks fine. So here, I'm trying to show at a more inferior level, normal filling of the transverse sinus, and then you get this absence of flow right at that junction. Here on the coronal view, you see small caliber at those transverse sigmoid sinus junctions. If you'd like to confirm it, you can do MRV. 
So you can see superior sagittal sinus, the torcular, the proximal portions of the transverse sinuses, and then absence of flow at those transverse sigmoid sinus junctions with normal flow in the sigmoid sinus more distal and then normal jugs. Same thing on this view, and here's the source image which shows decreased flow. It's not actually absence of flow, but on these images you show a flow defect at those junctions. In the other category, you have otospongiosis, aka otosclerosis. This is primary osteodystrophy of the otic capsule. It comes in two flavors, fenestral and retrofenestral. Fenestral is the most common here at the fistula antifenestrum. You get conversion of that cortical bone to spongy bone, which becomes sticky and in some cases can result in pulsatile tinnitus. So here's that lucency where you should have cortical bone. Here it is again, lucency in that fistula antifenestrum between the cochlea and the semicircular canals, and here it is on the coronal view. And last but not least, we have Paget disease, which is a metabolic bone disease resulting in excessive abnormal bone remodeling. It has three stages, lytic, mixed, and sclerotic stages. And because of all of this bony remodeling, especially this bony hypertrophy at the skull base, this can result in pulsatile tinnitus, even though the mechanism is not definitely known why it does. You can imagine all this bony hypertrophy will affect acoustics at the skull base. Thank you for watching my video. Thanks everyone for tuning in for this great video from Dr. Bailey about pulsatile tinnitus and its causes. If you haven't checked out the other videos, be sure to check out the site at learnerradiology.com. Like the videos in here and be sure to subscribe to get new notifications when new videos are coming out. Thanks again.